John, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. John, it's really great to be with you again and my wholehearted thanks for your hospitality. I would especially like to acknowledge your generous support of the Broken Bay Institute for making this interview possible and I extend to you warm greetings from all of the Lash communities back home in Australia. You have published in a number of your books that people living with a disability have taught you a great deal. In fact, you go as far as saying, quote, people living with a disability have not only taught me, they have transformed me and brought me into a new and deeper vision of humanity. They are helping discover who I am, what my deepest needs are, and what it actually means to be human. How have people living with a disability taught you what it means to be human? I think the, the, the wonderful thing about people with disabilities is they're not people of the head. I mean, they're not going to come to theology courses or they're not going to teach, but they're people of the heart. And there's this mysterious compensation. Less there is of the head, more there can be, can be of the heart. Therefore, they're people of relationship. And this is the heart of what Jesus brings, but it's also the heart of humanity. And uh, the danger of humanity is that we create divisions. Uh, you know, in Australia, there are all the systems of division. And one of the fundamental divisions which you find in Australia, which we have in Canada, are the, uh, those people who were there before people from England and elsewhere arrived. And so there's the division between the Aborigines and the... So this is just one division. But there's also, when there's division, there's fear. Uh, how to get to meet people. And of course the Aboriginal people are, are so very different in one year. But at the same time they're so very much the same. They're people. They have hearts. They have hearts that want to be open. So, people with disabilities are the people of the heart. They teach us then how to move from the head to the heart. I remember here a meeting we had and it was with future priests. I had a meeting with all of them. They were here for a month. And after a time that they were here, pretty well everyone said more or less this, Living with them, I feel transformed. You see, in the whole, like, uh, people like these future priests, they do lots of theology. And theology tells you what to think. It gives you a certain power. Uh, you know what sh it should be and we can prove and so on. But when you enter into a relationship with people with disabilities, you don't know. You don't know how to relate. And like in all relationships, we never quite know where it's going to lead to. When there's a friendship, where does it lead to? So the difference between the theological things and the we know, because we've done studies, we have a diploma and all that sort of stuff, and relationship, we don't know. We let ourselves be guided. And so for those uh, young men who were becoming priests, they had to make the shift. So, people with disabilities teach us to make the shift. And therefore, to listen, to be attentive, uh, to try to understand what people are saying. So, it's a world of relationship. And there again, what is very particular of people with disabilities, they're allowed to be crazy. You know, they're free to say what they want or to fool around. Whereas many of us, you know, we have to fit into the context and do what people expect us to do. Uh, we expect people with disabilities to fool around, to be free. So I think they help people living with them to be free. They teach us the road of love and of relationships. 
in your book drawn into the mystery of Jesus through the Gospel of John, you invite your readers to meet St John's heavenly Lord. You tell us to view the Gospel of John like a letter from a friend. A friend inviting you into a deeper relationship with him. You paint a picture as to how Jesus calls us to break down barriers. Why has John's Gospel been such a point of focus and inspiration for you? And why do you often retell the Samaritan woman at the well story? Well, the Gospel of John is really a Gospel leading us to friendship with Jesus. Uh, and we see in the 14th, 15th chapter of John, I don't call you my servants, I call you my friends. And everything the Father has given me, I've, I've told you. And you see in the sixth chapter of the Eucharist, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in them. So everything is about growth to friendship. And at the end of the, we discover after Jesus has washed the feet of the disciples, he tells them, what is the way that he wants? What is the, his commandment? What is the most important? And the commandment is just love one another as I have loved you. So it's about calling people into friendship, entering into a relationship with them. And this is the heart of Lash. And so I find the Gospel of John is the Gospel of relationship, the Gospel of friendship. And so in a way, Jesus is teaching us to become friends to all people. In the third chapter, we see Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a theologian. We know. <laughs> we know that somebody who does signs like you, you know, must be sent from God. I mean, there's knowledge. So uh, he's going to make a sort of inquiry with Lash. So the relationship is the relationship of somebody intelligent who's come to really see who is this man, Jesus. And the conversation begins. But Nicodemus doesn't really accept the witnessing of Jesus. The Samaritan woman, who doesn't know Jesus at all, he's just this Jew, obviously, with an accent from Galilee, he's sitting by the well, and she knows nothing. <laughs> but she is a woman that has been humiliated because the Jews look down on the Samaritans. Just as the Romans look down on the Jews, the Jews look down. On... And I believe also that she's a woman that had lived with five men, so she had family problems, she had all sorts of... And maybe she was in some way despised by the Samaritan group. And there there's a meeting between a woman who's despised, uh, not at all the Nicodemus, I know, we know, but a woman who's fragile. Who is, and Jesus meets her in her fragility. Will you give me to drink? So, and there what happens is, is that relationship, and she is transformed. At the end, she rushes off, leaving her picture, because the apostles have arrived back, and she rushes up to the people in the village. She's transformed. I met a man. He told me everything I did. Maybe it's the Christ. So we see two things. Nicodemus, who judges and wants to, and a woman who's discovered that though she's been pushed aside, is loved. So a friendship. And maybe the whole message of Jesus is to meet those who have been humiliated. So it's about friendship. And so uh, the Samaritan woman teaches us in a special way, you know, this desire for Jesus to meet people. Pope Francis has called an extraordinary Jubilee of Mercy for 2016. In the official Bull of Indiction, Pope Francis begins a document with, quote, 
Jesus is the face of the Father's mercy. These words might well sum up the mystery of the Christian faith. How can we embrace a church of mercy in today's world? What does a church of mercy look like? Well, the church of mercy will be the church of those who believe in Jesus. So it's not just a group, it's individual people. Individual people who've discovered that the mission of Jesus is their mission. What is the mission of Jesus? It's true now it's a good news, a good news to the poor. And who are the poor? They're those who feel lost, been pushed aside, unloved, humiliated, be they people off the streets, or, or be it young people, or be it those who are caught up, uh, just had cancer announced, but people who feel lost. And feeling lost, they don't, they feel unable to live in society and the same. So, the Church of Mercy is a church who become like Jesus. Uh, and what Francis has said many times, to go into the periphery, meet people, meet people. And to meet people, to announce the good news. And what is that good news? to announce to the poor, is not Jesus loves you, but I love you, and I want to get committed to you. This could be people in the streets, it could be people, uh, Aborigines, it could be people, whoever it is, the broken and the lost. Because Jesus came to announce a good news to the poor, freedom to the oppressed, capital freedom to captive, sight to the blind, help people to see the truth. So it's, it's pushing people to go to the, to the borders, to the limits, to meet those who have been rejected, to meet the lonely, to meet the lonely and who have no friends and so on, to help them to discover you are more beautiful than you dare believe. The Templeton Prize honours a living person who has made an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension, whether through insight, discovery, or indeed practical actions. The prize aims to identify, quote, entrepreneurs of the spirit, end quote, outstanding individuals who have devoted their talents to expanding our vision of the human purpose. Past winners of this award include Mother Teresa, Brother Roger, Desmond Tutu, and the 14th Dalai Lama. Jean, describe your reaction on winning the 2015 Templeton Prize. What does it mean to you and to all of the Lash communities throughout the world? Well, it began with a phone call from uh, Dr. Jack Templeton, and uh, my first reaction was surprise and then amazement. And then delight. You see, there's the focus on one way, on myself, which is the messenger. But then the greatest focus must be on the message. And the message is about people with disabilities. So what the, the prize is saying, don't look so much at the messenger, look at the message. And that message is a very simple message people with disabilities are super people. And not only super people, but they have something to tell society, they have something to tell the church. So we must be attentive to the mystery that is there. And that mystery is that that can lead us little by little into a world where there's greater love. And to discover that the future of humanity could only come really, if we learn to love each other as Jesus taught us. So Templeton Prize is really the prize for people with disabilities. And of course, it's great for Lash, great for Faith and Light, which is a cousin of Lash. And just to revealing that what we've been living, now it'll be better known by many people. 
Pope Francis recently released his second papal encyclical, titled Laudato Si. Are you able to reflect on Laudato Si? How will this encyclical challenge people to, quote, care for our common home? It's a, an amazing document which brings together theology, science, English thinking. And what is amazing is the reaction, like here in France, as a sociologist who's very well known, not at all Christian, and he said, when he read this encyclical, he said, this is the first act in the birth of a new civilization. So it's something about caring for each other, about caring for the planet, that we must work together. So there's something extremely beautiful. And what is so beautiful is the Pope is coming up as the wise person of humanity, more than United Nations, more than, but saying, be careful. We have a treasure here. This treasure is our planet. And so it's a call for people to become open. And of course, inside of all this, he has intertwined all sorts of elements of not just theology and philosophy, but also economy and, and so on. He's intertwining, and you get a vision of wisdom there. And in a wisdom, he's saying to everybody, not just to to Catholics, you know, there's a treasure there which we must work together. Work together, or we're going to kill humanity. So there's, there's a call which is, I find, incredibly beautiful and incredibly strong. John, what do you believe is the greatest spiritual issue of today? And how should people approach and or address it? The greatest evil is division. And from division, fear. The opposite of peace is fear. People are frightened. And because they're frightened, they're closing in. And then, so we'll be moving into a world where people are frightened, there's fundamentalism. They close up. Uh, they're frightened of the other. Uh, whereas really, what Jesus has come is to teach us to be open, to, to understand. So, I would say the greatest evil is division, but division is founded on fear, and fear is the closing up in forms of fundamentalism, then thinking we are the only ones who are good, instead of opening up. So, we're in a period of humanity, uh, which came to an end at the 1945, at the end of the war. Well, there there was a consciousness that every person was important. That behind the Catholic, the Jew, the Aborigine, there is a person. And that person is created by God and is important. So we're in a world where people are important. So it's the coming back to this realization. The dangers are all the forms of closing up. Whereas the Pope, and particularly the extraordinary Vatican II, I mean, it's an extraordinary document, and that the, the, the dignity of every human being is personal conscience. The personal conscience is that part of our being which is like a sacred sanctuary where God speaks to each person. So it's the person inciting them, calling them to the things of love and drawing them away from the things of hate. So the, the big thing is openness. But that openness comes as we grow closer to God. So get closer to God to be closer to others. Sean, I'm often amazed about this reality of mystery in disability, 
relationships and communities. I was wondering whether you'd be able to comment on this. Mystery is something um, which we can't possess by the heart. It's something that seems to be higher, deeper. Uh, we try to get closer to it, but more we get closer to it, more we sense we're further away from it. Uh, it's this mystery where a secret, once it's been told, it's no longer a secret. A mystery is something which calls us deeper. And it's something about my person being led into something which is, which is the reality of God. And so we can have all sorts of ideas about God. We can say all sorts of things. But everything being said and done, uh, God is so much bigger and greater. And even the history of the church is an extraordinary thing. It's the gradual entry into discovery of everything that was contained in Revelation, but has taken time to discover it. So the, the whole is penetrating deeper into the heart of God. I mean, when you see the saints, there's a sort of the saints that began with the martyrs and then to the fathers and then to the brothers in the Middle Ages with uh, the Dominicans and, uh, and Francis. And then today, Bernadette and Therese, the little ones. So there's a penetration into the mystery of God. And you find how theology has evolved, how at some times the church became closed. But then there was that extraordinary uh, explosion of Vatican II. And so there's a sort of penetrating into the mystery of God and the mystery of humanity. And today, particularly after Vatican II, and then with those incredible meetings of Jean-Paul II in the, in the Assisi, you know, where all people of all religions came and you know, there's, there's a penetration into who is God and what is this love of God and the deepening of God is not just the one who sends us revelation but God is in love with the weakest and the littlest and the loneliest. So there's a sort of, it's all been there in revelation but Humanity and the church has little by little penetrated. You see this also with the mystery of Mary. You find very little in the early church, but then there's the gradual discovery, and then the announcing of the assumption, and you know the. So there's been a gradual discovery, and that God is so much greater, so much bigger, so much littler then we all dare believe. And so mystery is calling us into the heart of God. John, I'd like to end the interview with the snippet of a speech given by the Templeton family upon awarding you the Templeton Prize earlier in the year. Quote, Jean Vanier underscores how each of us has the ability not only to lift up others, but also to lift up ourselves. His powerful message and practice of love has the potential to change the world for the better, just as it has already changed the lives of countless individuals who have been touched by this extraordinary man. Sean, may God bless you abundantly. Until we meet again, thank you. Thank you. Peace to you. Thank you. Peace.